Boa tarde a todos e todas. Eu tenho enorme prazer em dar início ao terceiro encontro anual da Rede Nacional de Ciência para a Educação. Este ano, na modalidade inteiramente remota, e agradeço a presença de todos. Acho que teremos uma reunião bastante produtiva. E antes de começar a sessão, eu queria fazer duas, dois agradecimentos. Um aos nossos patrocinadores, que são membros institucionais da rede, o Instituto Ayrton Senna, o Instituto DOR de Pesquisa e Ensino, e a Somos Educação, e o outro, as duas empresas que estão nos auxiliando na organização do evento, a Mescla Eventos e a E-Target. Ah, e queria dizer que nós vamos começar com uma sessão extremamente importante, que é, tem como tema a educação depois da pandemia, como a ciência pode ajudar. E vamos ter dois palestrantes internacionais que falarão em inglês. Então, eu convido a todos vocês que gostariam de utilizar a tradução simultânea do inglês para o português, que usem o botãozinho que tem aqui embaixo na tela de vocês, para habilitar a tradução. Eu vou ter que passar agora para uh, o inglês, para fazer a introdução da nossa primeira palestrante, que vai falar muito rapidamente, numa versão gravada, que é a doutora Stefania Giannini. Então, Dr. Stefania Giannini was appointed the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Education in May 2018, becoming the top uh, United Nations official in the field. In this position, she provides a strategic vision and leadership for UNESCO in coordinating and monitoring the implementation of this, of the Education 2030 Agenda encapsulated in Sustainable Developmental Development Goal 4. With an academic background in the humanities, uh, Dr. Giannini has served as rector of the University for Foreigners in Perugia from 2004 to 2012, being one of the first and uh, youngest women to hold this position in Italy. As Senator of the Republic of Italy, 2013 to 2018, and then Minister of Education, Universities and Research, 2014 to 2016, she developed and implemented the structural reform of Italian education system centered on social inclusion and cultural awareness. She has also been closely involved in an advisory capacity with the European Commissioner for Research and Innovation. Dr. Giannini uh, recorded uh, an address to the meeting uh, and we are very grateful for, his, for her um, presence in our annual meeting. So let's start the recording, please. Colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am really delighted to join you today for the inauguration of this year's meeting of the Brazilian Network of Science for Education. You meet under unprecedented uh, circumstances, uh, ones that uh, also offer us opportunities to transform education around more inclusion, equity and resilience. We know numbers, uh, almost 1.6 billion students have been affected by school closures during the last uh, uh, eight months and uh, 63 million primary and secondary school teachers. Uh, never, never in history we said something like this. Today schools remain closed uh, in 32 countries still, affecting more than 500 million learners. So it's still in the middle of the crisis. 
and 24 million children, according to our UNESCO projections and youth, are at risk today of not returning to school because of the economic impact of COVID-19. And this is about really amplifying the education crisis and amplifying inequalities as well. Although governments around the globe reacted so quickly, so innovatively uh, to ensure learning continuity, the disruption has widened uh, all, all the problems we had before. I already mentioned inequalities, uh, which everywhere are hitting the most vulnerable and the hardest. And lack of connectivity is one of the major obstacles we have today. Over 500 million students have no internet at all, and half the world's households have no computer. That means to be out of the game. The scientific community has the key role to play in this response to the pandemic. Evidence, data are key to assess learning losses and mitigate them. Innovations are, is just a ski uh, because learning environments will become a hybrid with a mix of uh, in-person and remote learning. This is something you already could see uh, in many countries of the world. And this implies new pedagogies and tools. And this implies, let me say, a new mindset, a new way of learning and teaching. The role of social and emotional competencies in learning must gain greater recognition, more than ever now that we are relying on technology, as a paradox, I should say. Most importantly, teachers must be fully engaged for the educational recovery to succeed. Well, going forward, looking at the future, at the near future, research, policy, and practice must be interlinked. Interlinked to design and implement effective learning solutions that work for all learners, especially the most disadvantaged. You remember the last uh, um, education uh, GEM report, uh, UNESCO GEM report, all means all. UNESCO provides a platform to share best practices, support capacity building, and encourage policy dialogue. In March this year, we launched a global education coalition bringing together uh, today more than one one, 150 partners to support countries develop solutions and ensure learning continuity, also from the private sector. Today, UNESCO is holding a global education meeting precisely to secure commitments at the highest level from heads of state and ministers uh, of education and development to protect education financing and agree on priority action to leave no learner behind. A leap into the future has been forced upon us and uh, it's our collective responsibility today to size this moment to put quality education for all at the center of every societal project. We have a momentum and we have to keep it. In the words of uh, the great Brazilian writer Machado de Assis, uh, it's the occasion that makes the revolution. I wish you a successful meeting. Hi, Roberto. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Um, Hi. Warm greetings from uh, Paris. Um, you will introduce me, Roberto, I assume? Yes, I will, uh, Dirk. I am uh, waiting for uh, the instructions of the technical people, and I'll uh, introduce you, sure. Well, let's start the second part of this uh, opening uh, session. I uh, now have the great pleasure uh, uh, to introduce you, Dr. Dirk Van Dam. Uh, Dirk uh, is a PhD from Ghent uh, University, and she, he is uh, the senior counselor in the Directorate for Education and Skills of the OECD in Paris an acting head of the Center for Educational Research and Innovation. Before joining the OECD in the, uh, 2008, he was professor of educational research in Ghent University, Belgium, and comparative education at Free University, Brussels, Belgium, 
and visiting professor at Seton Hall University at New Jersey, USA. He was counselor for several Flemish education ministers from 1992 to 2000, general director of the Flemish Rector's Conference and chief of staff of Minister Frank uh, van der Broek from 2004 to 2008. He published extensively on educational, educational quality assurance and evaluation and was a board member and expert to various quality assurance agencies and international organizations. At the OECD, he is supervising and promoting work on educational technology, the assessment of social and emotional skills and innovation in education. His current interests are the science of learning, comparative analysis of educational systems, lifelong learning and higher educational education policy and evaluation. Uh, Dirk was uh, speak uh, online directly from Paris and uh, we are very thankful for his presence, uh, his presence among us. Uh, so I uh, pass the word to him uh, immediately. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk, for your presence. Thank you so much, uh, Roberto, for your kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to, to join you uh, tonight. Um, I always like to be with educational researchers, being an educational researcher myself. Uh, and um, even if this meeting is... Uh, virtual and I cannot engage in, in personal conversations with you, uh, I still um, like to, to be here and to uh, give you my um, address. Let me share my presentation. Um, okay. Oops. Oops. Okay, I would like to focus uh, my talk tonight on um, what we learn um, today in the international community about uh, education and the impact of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Because I think this um, is a huge opportunity for educational science, educational research. Um, and I will come back to uh, the challenges that we can help to solve uh, being educational researchers towards the end um, of my talk. Um, I think it's needless to say that uh, the COVID crisis is really disrupting education. I think education in the world has never been disrupted um, to this uh, extent. And that's also what um, um, the previous speaker, Janini, uh, uh, has, uh, has mentioned. This is a really serious uh, crisis. Um, Brazil is very heavily hit by the crisis. You know that much better than I do. I just look at the statistics and with over 5 million confirmed cases, and I uh, downloaded the, the most recent data yesterday uh, from the WHO um, and 150,000 dead people um, because of Corona. Um, you are really one of the most hit countries um, in the world, together with the United States, uh, India, Russia, uh, et, and etc. Um, so this crisis, this pandemic is hitting your society and your economy uh, extremely hard. In education, uh, as you know, UNESCO is monitoring uh, the school closures. Um, in education, we have seen uh, uh, a first wave of school closures in, in the spring, at least the spring in the Northern Hemisphere, um, including Europe. Um, but in many countries, school closures are still happening. And I understand that in Brazil, it's now a rather mixed reality with schools being closed in, in some provinces and municipalities and cities. Others are partially um, open, but the number of 
students affected uh, in your country is extremely um, extremely high. We speak about um, 52 million students that are hit in total by these um, school closures uh, on all levels of education. So this is um, quite significant, very serious, um, and it will have a huge and lasting um, impact. The um, situation in your country is a bit different from other countries. Um, as I mentioned in Europe, we have had a first wave in um, the months between March and uh, May, June this year. Um, some countries have really been heavily hit, like Italy, Spain, uh, my own country, Belgium, but also countries like the Netherlands, uh, the UK. Um, and we have had then a, a rather calm summer with uh, low levels of uh, infections and hospitalizations. But we are now seeing a, a, a very significant surge against what we call the second wave. Um, and we don't know yet how serious um, it will be. In Brazil, you are still experiencing a very long first wave. So the first wave is more stretched, is very heavy, um, and you have not really yet recovered. Uh, and that's the same for some other countries in the southern hemisphere, like um, South Africa. Um, unfortunately, um, looking at the data that the OECD has, and especially the data from PISA 2018, we know that some education systems were really not well prepared to cope with this disruption. And Brazil is one of the countries which really had not the kind of situation in education that would allow it to be resilient in this um, crisis. Um, let's look at a number of indicators. Um, first of all, and these data come all from PISA 2018, um, the access to a computer to do schoolwork, either at home or at school. Um, Brazil is one of the countries really at the end of the, of the chart um, with almost uh, yeah, a bit less than 60% of students that have access to, to a computer to do schoolwork. It doesn't mean continuous access, but can be sporadically uh, having a computer um, to be accessed at, sco at school or at home. But you see also the enormous um, cleavage, the, the enormous spread between students in advantaged schools and students in disadvantaged schools. This is a, a second very important theme uh, that I would like to stress, which is um, the enormous increase in all indicators of inequality in education. So the crisis has really amplified uh, all kinds of indicators referring to educational inequality. Um, and in Brazil, this is very pronounced. You have a, an education system which is hugely unequal, and the crisis is, of course, amplifying this. Another indicator is the number of digital devices for instruction that teachers can use for instruction. Here, uh, Brazil is really at the far end of the, of the distribution among countries. Um, only a bit more than 20% of schools um, or 23% of students are enrolled in schools where um, there are sufficient digital devices for instruction. So this means that when schools are closed, teachers do not have easy access to computers to move to digital education, distance education, e-learning, uh, etc. Another indicator is what we call the, the second digital divide. The first digital divide is about infrastructure, access to computers, connectivity to the internet. The second um, digital divide is with regard to skills and competences of teachers. And here again, Brazil is not doing well. Only 50%, according to our data, of teachers in Brazil have the sufficient skills not only technical, but certainly also pedagogical skills 
to integrate digital learning in instruction. This is um, quite a serious uh, figure um, because if teachers don't know how to use technology to smoothly switch from in-person teaching in classrooms to distance learning uh, through uh, digital means, then um, the disruption for learners, for students is even more dramatic. The resources for teachers to learn these digital skills are not available. Only a little bit more than 40% of students are in schools where the uh, leadership says that teachers have the availability to learn these digital devices. So they don't have the skills and they don't have the means and the availability to learn those skills. And finally, um, digital education, switch, switching to digital education not only requires computers, internet skills, but also the sufficient pedagogical software learning systems, learning support systems, um, learning management systems. And also here, Brazil is um, not doing uh, really well. Only 35% uh, of schools have um, something which you could call an online learning support platform. Um, and again, with a huge gap, a huge discrepancy between uh, disadvantaged schools and advantaged schools. Um, among disadvantaged schools, this figures uh, goes down to lower than 20%. So the conditions were not there to switch to online digital education. Uh, I must say this has, in, in no country I know of, this has taken, um, this has happened in a smooth way, in a successful way. In all countries you have seen that the teachers and the schools have struggled to switch often from one day to another uh, from in-person teaching in classrooms to distance learning. But some countries were better equipped, better prepared. Brazil was and is not prepared to do that. And you are in a situation um, where the, let's say what we call educational failure was already very high before the pandemic struck. In this chart, you see at the vertical axis, the number of students, 15 year olds, who were low performers in PISA 2015. Um, and that figure is something like 43%. 43% uh, of 15 year olds were low performers in, in PISA. Um, and on the horizontal access, you have the number of needs. Needs are a very important indicator on uh, how well education links to the transition to the labor market. The number of people who fall between school and employment, who are neither in employment nor in education, and those people we call the needs, um, this percentage is, is really very high in Brazil as well. So that means that 15-year-olds who leave school are dropouts, who don't leave school with a decent qualification, don't go smoothly uh, into the labor market. Uh, so your educational track record wasn't very successful even before the pandemic struck. We did a survey uh, at the OECD together with um, Harvard uh, graduate School of Education to understand very quickly, we did this survey in April and another one in May, June, um, what kind of strategies that countries were deploying to uh, cope with the immediate impact um, of the crisis. Uh, we call these strategies contingency strategies. Um, and actually the picture um, that this survey provided was quite positive. We were positively surprised. I don't have specific data for Brazil, so I just give you the average across 36 countries where we uh, received responses from. 
um, responses from teachers, from school principals, from uh, ministries, etc. Um, and the picture that emerges from this first chart is that actually everyone in education has done an utmost best, really went the extra mile to make sure that the pandemic did not hit too much the students. So it, everybody did everything possible to help. And the contingency strategies that schools deployed were actually well planned, well executed, well managed, and especially developed in a collaborative manner, including teachers. This is actually a little bit surprising, um, but you see the same thing also in the health sector. Um, health professionals also did do and are doing everything possible, even sacrificing their own safety, their own health, their own security to help patients. The same happens to education. And this is because of the strong professional morale in education, the ethics that all educators share, that they care for their students. Um, and this may sound a little bit soft, but it's extremely important. It's the decisive factor which makes that uh, an education system still survives um, the disruption of the pandemic. What was the focus of these strategies? Um, it was, first of all, to make sure that the continuity of academic learning of students was uh, ensured so that uh, the learning of students could move forward, also that the assessment of students could move forward. Um, that has not always been successful, but at least the, um, the desire, the attempt was there to uh, work as much as possible to make sure that students could proceed, uh, continue uh, with their learning. And a bit further down, also to ensure the well-being of of students, uh, give extra support to disadvantaged students, support for parents and caretakers, et cetera, et cetera. So again, a rather um, a, a impressive um, positive picture. Um, what kind of media and resources were used in those 36 countries? Um, Online instructional resources, of course, uh, online instruction, instructional packages, but also uh, some, um, let's say, communication and media tools, which many uh, people would consider to be outdated, like educational television and even radio. Um, and that's, uh, that's interesting because when countries uh, understood that maybe online education was a goal, was an objective, which was not within reach of schools. Uh, some countries switched to television and radio to compensate for the lack of uh, availability of online teaching and learning. But, and that's maybe then the, the downside of, of the picture, the learning loss has been very, very significant. We have not yet a lot of research, and I know a lot of research is being done now to measure the learning loss in countries. Um, there are some countries which are now producing quite interesting data, uh, and I would certainly say to the educational research community, I think this is the first priority, try to assess the learning loss at a, an aggregate level, but also at the individual level, because when schools will restart, you have to assess where each and every student is in his learning, in, his, in the progress uh, of his learning, and to design appropriate remediation strategies. So the learning loss, and uh, these are data from an interesting study in my own country, um, one of the first uh, really serious studies, and you see that um, uh, a point two standard deviation loss has been noted. This, um, this is a quite serious loss. A 0.2 standard deviation is more or less equivalent to a half year of schooling in mathematics.
but you also see the distribution over the, the, the whole range. So the most serious loss was at the left side of the chart where you have um, the lower performing students. The well-performing students experienced much less uh, loss in, in their learning. They were better capable of coping with digital education. They were better able to um, self-directed learning. Um, but it's the more vulnerable students, those who already suffered, who really um, uh, were confronted with the most serious loss of learning. Another chart, this, this comes from a survey in the UK. Uh, it's not a real measurement. The previous chart was a real measurement of uh, performance of students. This is an assessment which was done by uh, teachers. Um, and you see in this chart the, um, the inequality aspect. So in disadvantaged schools, in the most deprived schools with the purple bars, you see that the um, that the learning, uh, uh, excuse me, the, the least deprived schools with the purple bar, um, the average learning loss is between two and three months, whereas in the most deprived schools, the learning loss goes to, to between three, four, even five months of learning. Um, so this is um, actually suggesting, but, but this is an assessment of teachers. And we know that teachers are probably um, too optimistic with regard to the learning loss. That's also what we saw in my own country. When we interviewed um, teachers, they said, well, actually the learning loss is, is quite low. But when we actually assessed students, we saw that the learning loss was quite significant. So this, this chart comes from the assessment by teachers. This is an interesting chart from a just published study in the United States, which is about digital learning. Um, and again, um, differentiating according to the um, income situation of the, the family. So the family, the economic family background. And you see that um, when schools were closed uh, mid-March, and schools had to switch to an online platform. And these data come from um, a mathematics platform, which is very widely used in the, in the United States, the Zern platform. Um, it's a kind of automated uh, tool for uh, mathematics teaching and learning. You see that the uh, students from well-off families, well, they did cope rather well with this switch and they were able to to move to um, uh, independent studying and learning on this platform with, with quite some success. So the chart shows the number of, um, of exercises that were completed successfully online. Uh, but at the bottom of the chart, you see the bottom 25% economically for, of students which really suffered and they did not cope well with the switch to distance education and online learning. That's something that we see in all possible surveys and, and researches which are now being published. Uh, this, this enormous inequality gap, which is uh, ex really exploding. Um, many schools even lost track of students. They, they, they could not identify. I, I guess that this is also a situation in some schools in Brazil that some students just disappear from the radar. Um, uh, some are uh, within reach of schools, but they don't uh, have an effective learning process. So this is um, quite dramatic. We need much more adequate assessment and measurements to really understand what, what has happened and what is happening during the COVID crisis and to understand this um, enormous problem of, um, of inequality. I am sure that we will still have to face, and probably in Brazil, this is uh, also the case, um, that the homeschooling, digital learning, remote education will still be with us. I'm coming back to that because that's a, an enormous challenge for the research community to quickly redesign the teaching and learning environments in order 
to uh, empower schools, empower teachers and learners to uh, move to this new um, reality. This homeschooling, remote education, digital learning will still be with us and we better make it better uh, for our students. Um, to finish this uh, part, um, the economic consequences of a learning loss are enormous. So we just published last week a book by Eric Hanoshek, uh, which is a well-known educational economist. Um, and he calculated the uh, loss for the rest of the century uh, for a number of countries because of the long-term drop in skills in the population. So if the learning loss is not compensated, not remediated, and continues in the, in the adult lifetime of workers, what is the impact of the loss of skills in the working population? Um, and for countries like China and United States, this, this is enormous because they have a higher skilled population. But for Brazil, we estimate that 2,000 billion US dollars will be lost in economic income in the rest of the century, which is enormous. Um, it's not the most heavily hit because you have a different skills distribution, um, but this is uh, very, very significant. And it will lead to impoverishment of large part of the, of the population, uh, even uh, many decades after the pandemic hopefully will be behind us. So I'm, I'm coming to the final section, which is um, what I think that educational research can do. What are the challenges that we have to focus on? Um, and I, I think this is a, a very important task for the science and research community because um, it's an illusion to think that we can smoothly go back to the old normal. The old normal in education is not going to come back. We should not be romantic. We will face um, an, a, a long time of disruption and consequences of, of disruption. So it's no longer the case that we will just open up schools and we then can resume what we are doing when schools were closed. We have to really rethink the teaching and learning process we have to rethink some of the fundamentals of how our educational systems are built, um, are constructed. And of course, educational research and the science of learning can help to do that and to remediate the harm inflicted by the pandemic. First challenge, uh, educational technology. You see now an enormous explosion of um, interest in educational technology, of course, first of all, from private companies who see an enormous market opportunity. Um, but um, uh, I, I quote here um, Justin Reich, which, who is one of the, for me, the, the best thinkers about education technology he is from MIT. Um, and he says, educational technology mania is back. Uh, so we, you see the internet exploding with all kinds of utopia-minded tech gurus promising that they are able to solve uh, all problems of education today. And this is a very dangerous development because it, it feeds into policymakers and they think that technology can solve everything. But as The Economist has written just uh, two weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago, Zoom is a lousy substitute for classrooms. We will not be able to uh, compensate the loss of schooling through technology. But technology will certainly play a very important part and we have to improve the distance education. Um, distance education is for the moment in many countries, even the most developed countries in Europe and, and North America, distance education is a reality with unprepared teachers, poor technology, poor edgeware, poor resources, with an enormous digital divide on several dimensions. So we need a massive effort 
not from a naive belief in, in education technology, but to really use educational technology for the pedagogical purposes that are so dear um, to us. Second challenge is about diversification. Um, our education systems are, as they have been built in the 19th and 20th centuries, they are very standardized. They have a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, educational standardization, to some extent, is beneficial because it brings all students from different backgrounds together in, in a school. But the one-size-fits-all approach is no longer adequate when your system is affected by such a severe crisis. Uh, and we see that. Um, in many countries, uh, there are reports in the UK and Canada and United States that parents are looking for alternatives to get their children out of public education. They go to private schools and they pay huge amounts of money. They invest in uh, private tutoring, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we will have the risk that education moves to a kind of two-tier system with the rich and that's, of course, already a reality in Brazil, but it will only be, only be amplified because of the pandemic, that the rich will pay for uh, excellent education um, and that the poor remain in public schools. Um, what do I mean with diversifying? Um, the pandemic is hitting every single student in a different way. And that depends on the home situation, the, depends on the access to technology. Um, and we have to design a very personalized approach um, informed by learning sciences, enabled by educational technology. You have so many interesting tools now to help schools to do that, learning analytics, learning management systems, et cetera. So we have to redesign the teaching and learning um, environments, not to just rebuild schools after the pandemic. Third enormous challenge for the educational research community, uh, and that's also something which uh, uh, Giannini mentioned, um, the social and emotional significance of schooling. When students left school, uh, were not able to go to school anymore, the, a lot of the secondary benefits disappeared as well. School meals, nutrition, which was and still is really essential for huge numbers of students, but also social networking, friendships, community life. Um, these social and emotional functions of the school have become very clear. And we have to better understand, we have some understanding, but we still have not enough research on social and emotional learning. Um, and I say this uh, with great pleasure to a Brazilian audience because we have worked in the past with, um, with Brazil um, on uh, developing um, several interesting research projects on social and emotional learning. Um, so this is something that we need to take up. Um, and even if I have made a case for personalization and individualization and learning, excessive individualization of learning is also a risk. Um, education, learning is a social process. It's a social happening. Um, and students learn as much through social interaction, even imitation, than through the very cognitive uh, dimensions of the learning process. And then also rethink evaluation and assessment. Uh, this is um, a topic for another speech probably, um, but of course uh, the pandemic has caused enormous disruptions in examinations with consequences for the educational trajectories of students, especially at the transition point between primary and secondary or between secondary and then the entry into higher education. Um, many countries have struggled with how to organize this in the best interest of students. Um, I think the research community has to work and think critically about new types of assessments. Um, and there is a huge policy need for this. 
uh, many countries are wondering whether the, I'm speaking now for the Northern, Northern Hemisphere, whether the end of year examinations um, in, in June 21 will take place as they should take place. Countries which have these huge national exams like uh, the UK with the GCES and, and, and France with the baccalaureate or Germany with the Abitur, um, they, they already are thinking, well, we are not going to, to have the opportunity to do that in the way that we are used to do that. So they are asking the research community, could you come up with alternatives way of assessing students so that we don't have to rely on these mass exams and huge halls with all the uh, hygiene and medical risks associated. So we have to think about assessment, about new types of credentials, uh, also digital uh, credentials. Um, there is a lot of research done on how blockchain technology can help with assessment, etc. So that's a fascinating field of research, but it's quite urgent. Finally, um, I'm, I would like to turn the, the, the argument around. The, so far, my argument or my reasoning was about the impact of the pandemic on education. But I also am a very strong believer that education is part of the solution. Education is also the key to defeating the pandemic. And I've written a piece uh, on, on that recently, which is published on the OECD COVID-19 website. Um, we come to understand, and we see it also in the statistics, that lower educated people have higher health risks than higher educated people. They easily come into hospital and they, their mortality rates are higher than those of higher educated people. Why is this? Even if you control for income, for all kinds of um, intermediate variables, um, education seems to have an autonomous impact on the health risks during the pandemic. Um, we know that the virus is not hitting everyone at the same level. The virus is discriminating. It's discriminating against poor people, against people with uh, minority backgrounds, but it's also discriminating against lower levels of education. And this probably has to do with skills, both cognitive skills. If you have to understand the health risks, you have to understand the messages coming through the media and, and through all kinds of communications about how to adjust your behavior. If you don't understand that, you are not um, motivated to adjust your behavior. I'm just giving you one example. The, the virus uh, follows um, an exponential curve. Not many people really understand exponential um, statistics very well. And we, we have seen from some research that people still think in linear ways about the risks and they underestimate the speed of the spread of the virus especially when the, when the curve is going up. So the cognitive element plays a role, but more importantly, the non-cognitive element, the willingness, the motivation to adjust your behavior is dependent on the level of your non-cognitive skills. Um, we, and that's something that we still need to research much further. Um, but there are some researchers now who say that social distancing, uh, wearing masks, etc. Um, is not happening to the level that we would wish it, it would happen because some people don't have the, the non-cognitive skills to control their own behavior. So better education also improves society's resilience. There is a, a correlation between the level of skills in the population and the severity with which the pandemic has hit that country. And so I'm back to the beginning of my talk, um, the circle is, is round and I thank you for your attention. I stop here. Thank you so much. Um, and I uh, don't have the opportunity to answer any questions, but uh, you're always welcome to come back to me by email or any other way of communication. Thank you. 
So thank you very, very much, Dirk, for your um, so uh, rich and instigating uh, lecture. And uh, we are very grateful for your presence in our meeting. I'm going now to switch to Portuguese to announce the next, uh, next uh, activity. Nós vamos eh, dar um intervalinho de cinco minutos. Recomeçamos às 19 horas com o nosso diálogo 1, novas tecnologias de pesquisa e intervenção em educação. Até já, então. Esperamos vocês às 19 horas.